Research has consistently shown that AP students are less likely to commit crimes than students who don't take AP classes. Now, the College Board has not released that data yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if they did. Now, in this country, we don't really doubt whether somebody who commits a crime that has money, that has influence, can afford a lawyer, that that person won't get a fair shake in our justice system. You have the right to an attorney, and we see that that's in the Bill of Rights. That is protected by the Sixth Amendment, that someone who is an American has a right to legal counsel. They have a right to someone to give them advice. Now, the question is, what about someone who can't afford an attorney? And then, of course, does this protection by the Sixth Amendment Amendment apply to the states. So Gideon versus Wainwright is a case that deals specifically with the rights of the accused and specifically whether an indigent defendant, now that is a defendant who is poor, a defendant who doesn't have the money to afford an attorney, whether this defendant who cannot afford an attorney will have an attorney appointed to them. Now, of course, the federal matter has already been resolved by the Bill of Rights. But before 1963, the Supreme Court had not definitively decided whether this Sixth Amendment right to an attorney applied to the states. In fact, in Betts v. Brady in the 1940s, the Supreme Court had previously decided that states do not violate the Bill of Rights by refusing to appoint an attorney. So we want to note here when we look at stare decisis the precedents that have already been set, that there was already a precedent established by a previous court that the states don't have to apply an attorney in all cases. Now, we want to note that this is a Warren Court decision, and the Warren Court, the same court that gave us the Tinker and Brown decisions, this court tended to focus on civil rights, civil liberties, and the rights of the accused. So let's go into the facts of the case. Clarence Earl Gideon was a Florida man who was charged with breaking and entering. Now, this is a felony offense. This is something that cost him jail time. He didn't have enough money to afford an attorney. And according to Florida law, the state did not have to provide him with an attorney. That was only a luxury that was provided to defendants in capital cases. So since Gideon's life was not on the line, the state of Florida refused to appoint him an attorney. So Gideon went to court and represented himself. Uh, this is not a man who had a great deal of legal expertise. And so Gideon was was found guilty. Now, while he was in jail, Gideon went to the law library, or I guess they didn't have a separate law library, but they had a library in the prison. And Gideon started reading up on the law, and he believed that he had the right to an attorney. Gideon, who of course didn't have an attorney with him in prison, applied for the writ of certiorari in his own hand. So imagine here the Supreme Court receiving this petition for a writ of certiorari, not from a high-powered lawyer, but from a prison inmate writing in his own messy handwriting. Gideon was able to take his case before the Supreme Court and argue that he was entitled to an attorney based on the Sixth Amendment protection. Now, again, remember, this is a selective incorporation case. So what Gideon is asking the Supreme Court to do is to apply the Bill of Rights to the state of Florida and say that every state has to give any felony defendant an attorney to give them legal advice, that this protection of the Bill of Rights is also applicable to the states. Selective incorporation, that's really important for this exam. Now for the opinion of the court, and this one's easy because this was a unanimous decision which was written by Justice Hugo Black. Curiously enough, Justice Black was one of the dissenters in the previous case of Betts versus Brady. So we can see an example of how the Supreme Court changed over time, how the Warren Court was really instrumental in changing the Supreme Court's stance on civil rights and liberties. So the court decided that Clarence Gideon did did have a right even though it was a state offense. And as such, the court is deciding to selectively incorporate the Sixth Amendment provision that any defendant 
is going to have a right to an attorney, whether that is a defendant in a federal court or a state court. So we want to note that Gideon versus Wainwright is a landmark case in the selective incorporation of the rights of the accused. Another case which we might be called upon to compare the Gideon case to would be Miranda versus Arizona. This is another Warren court case decided in 1966. Now in the case of Miranda, this was someone who was a accused of kidnapping and rape. And after being interrogated by police, he signed a typed confession, said that I am confessing of my own free will. I did it. Well, problem. And that problem is that the police never informed Miranda that he had the right to remain silent. And because he wasn't informed of that right, therefore the evidence was tainted and the conviction was overturned. Now, Miranda was not a unanimous decision. Miranda was a 5-4 decision with some pretty heated dissents because what you need to look at here is that a rapist who confessed to the crime was let go. But what you can see here in both Gideon and Miranda would be that the Warren court was especially stringent when it came to the rights of the accused. The whole principle that it is better to let a guilty person go free than to risk an innocent person having to go to jail. So we want to note that both of these cases are about selective incorporation and involving the rights of the accused. So that is Gideon versus Wainwright. And for another selective incorporation case, you might want to check out the summary of McDonald versus Chicago. Always glad to help you. It's always a pleasure.